Ladies and gentlemen, in order to accommodate anyone having difficulty joining the meeting, we are going to wait until 32 minutes after the hour, that's two minutes from now, in order to begin the webinar. That's two minutes from now. Ladies and gentlemen, in order to accommodate those who are having difficulty joining or having any difficulty, we will be beginning the webinar in one minute, which will be 32 minutes after the hour. Ladies and gentlemen, the presentation will begin shortly. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the webinar. The topic for today is coding for CH, a call to community action which is part one of the DP coding series. Today in part one, we'll be discussing what coding is, what problems it does and does not solve, and what we as a community can do to solve those problems together to improve digitization workflows. Before we begin that topic, I do wanna frame the rest of the DT coding series so you understand where this presentation fits into that. On part two, Thursday of this week in just two short days, Pixel Acuity will be presenting how they use coding to streamline and automate their post-processing, including barcodes, file naming, derivative generation, OCR, and QC. These kind of advanced use case studies are the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow that can serve as motivation for you to invest the time and effort to become a coder yourself. In parts three, four, and five, we will provide step-by-step -step instruction, a walkthrough in real time of how to get started with three different coding platforms, AppleScript, Python, and Capture One SDK. For each of those platforms, we will begin at the beginning, installing the required applications, going all the way through, completing and troubleshooting a few simple but effective and practical tools. Finally, later this year, we will offer a two-day capstone class that dives much deeper into AppleScript, Python, and the Capture One SDK. This capstone class will culminate with a challenging certification test, after which you will be certified if you pass. Note that while the other five parts are all free, the capstone class will be a paid class. Finally, I'd like to note that parts one and two, including today's presentation, are heavily focused on the cultural heritage community of museums, libraries, and archives. If you personally are more interested and involved in the world of digital teching, commercial photo studios, e-commerce and that sort of thing, these topics will be framed a little bit outside of that, uh, that frame of reference. That said, you may still find them interesting as a form of cross-training since high-volume museum digitization, high-volume library digitization, and things like high-volume e-commerce share a lot more in common than you might think. Okay, so with the framing of the topic complete, I'd like to introduce the two presenters today. Uh, I guess I will start. My name is Doug Peterson. I'm the head of R&D and the head of product management at Digital Transitions. As of 2020, I'm also a co-owner of Digital Transitions. And 
Apropos to today's topic, I've been coding since I was 10 years old. I narrowly escaped, as I like to say, becoming a, a professional computer programmer as a living when I instead decided to attend Ohio University for commercial photography and visual communications. Hello, everyone. I'm Jeremy Moore. I'm the Digital Production Technical Manager at the University of Tennessee Libraries, where I have been since, the 20, since 2019. I often describe both my job and interests as doing stuff with things and have recently taken to self-defining as a software artist and visual philosopher. That's because I have an MFA in studio art photography from the University of North Texas, along with a couple of undergraduate degrees in philosophy and religious studies and social sciences. So today's presentation will cover five main groupings here, including ending with Q&A. I want to point out that if you are chatting in the chat window and you ask questions, we are absolutely reading those. A gentleman by the name of Arnab Chatterjee, Arnab from Digital Transitions, will be moderating the chat and flagging your questions so that we can see them. We will wait until the end of the presentation to address those questions, but we are paying attention to them and we will be very glad to address them. So what are we going to talk about? We're going to talk about, is it hard to code? What is code good at? Which language we think you should start with? And a call to action to join the community that Jeremy uh, is creating that DT is supporting of community coders. So is it hard to code? First, let's get out of the way that some of the terminology you see thrown around for computer programming sounds scary. In fact, it needn't be scary. Programming, for example, just means you're defining rules for how files should be handled. When you tell your staff, for example, process all files to 16-bit TIFFs. When you give them that as a verbal instruction, you're giving them rules to follow. Coding is just giving the computer rules to follow in a computer-specific language. That syntax and language are different than English, but the same idea applies. Algorithms, for example, are just recipes. Once you grasp the fundamental of a recipe, same as with food, for example, you'd learn how to swap out cinnamon for cocoa powder and season to your own taste. Coding libraries and modules are just someone else's work that you're not just allowed to, you're encouraged to borrow to use for your own projects. I think most people outside of programming, outside of that world, far underestimate just how much of every application you use is based on and borrows from open source code that someone has provided to the community to say, use this as you wish. And finally, data analysis is just a specific way of asking questions about a set of files or other inputs. So the point here is that before you get started in any field, whether what, no matter what that field is, or even a hobby, terminology in that field can sound intimidating. Once you get your feet just a little bit wet, you'll find these terms are not that scary. This is especially true because the kind of coding that we're talking about today is the lightest and easiest form of coding. Here is, for example, a diagram of Dante's Inferno of Hell of coding. And you can see that tweaking is one of the easiest forms, taking someone else's work and making small changes to your specific needs. Think about this in terms of formal academic citations. Does anyone here remember the exact formatting for memory, the spaces or commas, which italics and which underlines to use, and where to use parentheses versus brackets? I don't. Instead, most people do what I do, which is start with someone else's example of a citation and then modify it to your specific need. The same is true of coding. You're going to take someone else's work and tweak it. That is the most common form of programming and the one that we'll focus on today. Now, before I make it all sound like roses, I want to acknowledge and not gloss over the fact that it can be much harder and take longer than you think, depending on what the project is. Here, for example, is a joke from XKCD that lays out an idyllic theory of automating repetitive tasks. That is, the top halves shows the theory that you spend just a little extra time each day doing some programming, and then you can kick back, enjoy, relax, and just enjoy all of your free time. The reality is often closer to that second graph, where the effort to automate the task kind of takes on a life of its own. So we neither want you to be intimidated by coding or its terminology, nor do we want you to come at it with rose-colored glasses. It's not as hard as it sounds, but it's not a magic wand. An example of that, another area of difficulty, can be the challenge of getting started for the very first time. For example, here's a different XKCD cartoon, uh, comic that pokes fun at the many ways you can install Python on a computer. And it can show how that leads to a confusing mess of spaghetti on your computer. 
But that really drives home what will be our central point today. It's easier to code in community than it is to code in isolation. So for example, if you're developing in a community and someone has already been down this specific path, they've already developed that spaghetti and worked their way out of the problem, they can point you in the right direction from the start, making the entire process a lot easier. So working on your own, tasks like renaming and counting files or creating basic derivatives like a JPEG from a TIFF, those tasks will be easy. But more complex or involved tasks, like, for example, the automation of creation of metadata or sending your data to and from a CMS, those will be more challenging if you're working alone. But working as part of a community, even those more complex tasks can be made relatively simple for you to implement. For example, if Jeremy here has already written the code to name files based on a barcode, it's gonna be much easier for you to implement that, either exactly as he did, or making small tweaks to what your specific needs are. So in summary, coding can be sometimes hard. Sometimes it's harder than you think, sometimes it's easier than you think but it's always far easier if you're coding as part of a community. Later in this presentation, we're gonna make a specific call to action to have you join us in a community of coders so we can all help each other and we can all make it a lot easier on everyone. But now I'm gonna turn it over to Jeremy who will talk about what code is good at. First and foremost, coding does not have hard costs. Most coding tools are free. And good code can both increase productivity and decrease human error. Depending on how you're currently accomplishing a task, coding might even decrease or eliminate outsourcing costs. On the other hand, while coding does not have any hard costs, it does have considerable soft costs. Someone has to do the coding, which takes time and talent that might be spent better else elsewhere. And while it can eliminate human error, it introduces its own category of issues. And finally, while commercial software comes with support and maintenance from the manufacturer, coding means you take on that role for yourself. You'll be the one that has to explain how the code works to new staff, fix bugs that are found, and update the code over time as needed. Notably, the requirement for in-house time and talent can be greatly reduced by collaboration. So, if we are successful in increasing the amount of community participation in coding for cultural heritage, then the burden on any given institution will be reduced. So how do you know if it'll be worth it to auto try automating a task? The main factor is how much total time the coding could save you. And in this chart, once again, from XKCD, time savings are calculated for a five-year period, a reasonable window to look at for an institution. For example, a task that takes one minute and is done 50 times a day accumulates to eight weeks during that window. So if you are confident that automation will take significantly less than eight weeks, then at first glance, it'd be worth it to do so. We suggest adding a factor of five to your best guess though, since it's very easy to underestimate the time it takes to develop and maintain code. That still leaves a lot of opportunity though. For example, if a project requires a task that takes just five seconds for each of 10,000 items in that project, and you do 10 such projects per year, that's that task adds up to 25 days over five years. Even more dramatically, if your team is jointly doing an operation 1 million times per year and that operation only takes 10 seconds each time, that will actually add up to over or uh, up to nearly one full-time equivalent person, which across five years can mean somewhere in the ballpark of 200 to $400,000. So let's say we've identified a repetitive task that is taking a lot of time. How do we know if that task is well-suited to coding? Let's look at what code can and can't do. Coding can follow your rules exactly and relentlessly forever and ever. And if you never tell it to stop, ever. <laughs> this is the singular strength and weakness of code. In comparison, humans are better at understanding the why part of a rule. And so they can intuit when it makes sense to make an exception to a rule. But humans get tired and are easily distracted, dog, especially when doing tedious work. So coding, in short, works well for tasks where the rules are clear and always apply. A good rule of thumb here is, can you completely explain the task in one breath without any follow-up questions? For example, for every file in this folder, 
add master to the start of the file name. That rule doesn't beg any clarifications or follow-up. It is clear and applies without exception. In contrast, for example, for every object in this folder, flag modern materials is chock full of ambiguity. What is an object? Is a PDF of a book a single object, or is each page of that book an object? Should pages from a collage book be handled as a whole object, or as each mounted object therein? What year constitutes modern? I mean, are we talking like modern art or modern history? Is that the date of authorship, publication? What if sources disagree about the date? What if a particular object has more than one date? A human being given a task like this would likely have some immediate follow-up questions and would hopefully come up with some more questions as they went along. A computer does not ask follow-up questions of its own volition. Any nuance to the rules must be explicitly programmed. So we've discussed, is it hard to code? And we've talked about what code is good at. Let's say that in the course of that, we've convinced you and you're already thinking of tasks that it takes you a lot of time to do. In fact, you're now confident that those clearly definable tasks are conducive to coding. Where to go next? Which computer language, which computer programming language should you learn to code in? There are quite a few. In this presentation, we'd like to present three specific paths that we think are especially good for people starting in image processing, digital workflows, and other tasks related to those. AppleScript, Google Colab, and Python. First up will be AppleScript. One of the nicest parts about AppleScript is that an application to run and write AppleScript is already installed on every single Mac. Just go to Applications, Utilities, and launch the application called Script Editor. Script Editor is a lot like Text Edit, but it's intended specifically for AppleScript programming language writing. So starting with a blank document, you can type in one or more commands, save the document. Here, for example, I've saved it as a script called Hello World. And once it's saved, that text will be automatically formatted and color-coded based on the AppleScript programming language to make it more readable. For example, here the word say is blue because it's a command, it's a verb. That's it. You're ready to push play and the script will run. Hello world. Simple as that. Of course, saying hello world, we've not accomplished anything of practical value but you can accomplish useful tasks with just a few more lines of code. So for example, here's an example of four lines of code, four lines of code that standardize the crop sizes of selected variants. Notice that before the script is run, the width and height of each of these crops is slightly different. So if I use the normal copy paste function of capture one, the crops would become the same width and height, but the centers of the crop would also shift up, down, left, or right to match the image that I was copying from. If I wanna maintain the center location of each crop and only affect the width and height, the only way to do that natively inside of capture one is to go to each image and type in a new size, one image at a time. No big deal for one image, very big deal for hundreds. With code, I just push play, and that's it. The width and height will be changed without affecting the location of the crop. There's nothing going on behind the scenes here. There's no extra code. Everything you see in the bottom right corner there, those four lines of code, that's all that's necessary to set all of the widths and heights the same without affecting the location or absolute position in the frame of the crops. Now, let's imagine a different scenario. Let's imagine a workflow that calls for the subject matter expert to add a description for every single capture. How could you quickly check that one or more images didn't get missed, that a description wasn't missed on one of these images? Well, we could write a very short and simple script that provides QC for this specific step. Here's what that script would look like. Tell application capture 120, 
to tell the variants whose content description is empty to set color tag to red. This code says that Capture One should find any image whose content description is quote, quote, which is an empty string, and then set it to red. Simple as that. So as you saw, AppleScript is built into the operating system. The application to write it and to run it is already there, already installed. It also offers native control of other Mac applications. So for example, if you wanted to control Capture One, as we did in that example, or maybe to change the name of an upcoming file based on a field in a different application, Excel Spreadsheet, that is easier to do in AppleScript than any other programming language because you can natively push and boss around other applications using AppleScript. The main downsides of AppleScript are related to the fact that it's an Apple-only programming language. And realistically, it's likely to go away sometime in the future. That means it's not as wide of a community of developers, there are fewer projects already written in it, and there are fewer places and ways to collaborate using AppleScript than, for example, the presentation that Jeremy will give on Python. So now Jeremy is going to present Python, and he's gonna do that in two ways, as run inside of Google Colab, and separately as run locally on your computer. Since Google Colab may not be as familiar to everyone, let me start with some background before showing an example. Both the pros and cons of Google Colab stem from its nature as an online service provided by Google. Because it's online, there's nothing to install before you start using it, and it's natively easy to collaborate with others and to connect to data or documents inside the Google Suite. But being an online Google service, it doesn't scale well for large files, and it might change or be discontinued at any time. Google has an entire graveyard of products it's killed over the years. Not to mention, if you have any, inter, uh, if you have any issues with data security, or for instance, con uh, anything containing personally identifying data. So let's check out a demo. Google Colab runs notebooks that consist of stacked cells of either code or text information. Click Table of Contents to see a sidebar showing the organizational structure of my notebook. And the Table of Contents on the left shows there are no sections collapsed under my first section, Google Colab Examples. This corresponds to the first cell on the right. The first cell on the right that we're now going to talk about, Workflow Cost Savings Calculator, has been collapsed to show two subsections, Enter Book Capture and Process Data. By clicking the arrow next to Enter Book Capture and Process Data, you can show the hidden data in the next cell. Now the hidden cell is shown, which has some things to set. It, but it looks like the information is going off the page. So I'm going to close the table of contents on the left and scroll down a bit so you can see the, all of the form questions in the cell, enter book capture process data. We're going to put in how big our project is. 100 books with 240 pages each. And these are user manipulatable fields. So we can take the scrolling point for pages per book and adjust it from 240, which is what the value was the last time the cell was ran. And we can change it to, to our current project, which is an average of 180 pages per book. I'm gonna leave the current times per four seconds per book set up so that things happen only once per book and the other values stay the same. Now I will run this code cell by clicking play, though I really don't, I actually just use keyboard shortcuts. So shift and enter. And you can see the output of this code cell at the bottom below. One book with 180 pages will cost nearly $200 to digitize with our settings. The entire project will cost nearly $20,000. But wait, your boss just told you the initial estimate of 100 is too low. It's actually 323 books, but that's not a problem. So what we're gonna do is just enter the new value in. So that's where the first arrow is, and then go ahead and rerun the cell by clicking the play button again or using the keyboard shortcut shift and enter. Our time per book didn't change, so you know them, but we now know that our minimum is going to be 58,140 captures over 2,400 plus hours, and this is actually going to cost us over $60,000. But where's the code? It's actually hidden off to the left. I'm using variables in the code to create forms for easier data entry. To not belabor the point, I went ahead and ran the next cell about how much you could save on this particular project in both hours and dollars based on automating some different steps. By saving 20 seconds per book setup and under two minutes per image and processing quality control, 
you're cutting 63% off of the total time. You might actually be able to do two projects in the time in which you, before you could only do a single project. By saving Jeremy, don't tell people that. Setup, we'll just do the one project and then we'll sit back and relax and we can read a book. Sorry, I actually can't hear Doug saying anything, so I'm not sure what he said. <laughs> <laughs> so by saving 20 seconds per book setup and under two minutes per image and processing and quality control, you're cutting 63% off the total time. And those are pretty good figures. Moving on to working with images, here we're going to use the Google Suite to access data in Google Drive and a particular Google Sheet. I'm skipping over logging into my Google account and authorizing the code, but I can now have access to my Google Drive, which I've mounted to two variables drive path to the root of my Google Drive and data path to access a folder named data that's in the Google Drive. So if you're familiar with Google Drive, that's what this looks like there. So drive path, path accesses my, just everything that's in my drive and then data path is accessing that directory below. In the next slide, we're gonna access the information that I've added into this Google Sheet image statement. It's an inventory of expected images for the four books we've digitized. And so now back in the CoLab notebook, I've already run that code cell to import the inventory from a Google Sheet and convert it into what's called a data frame. This is a format used by an open source, Pyth Pyth open source Python library named Pandas. Think of Pandas as Python's version of Excel, though I would argue a much, 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 much better version of Excel. But who cares about just the expected images you're saying, right? Well, I agree. How many are actually saved to the data directory, data directory in our Google Drive? we can actually grab that information and add it right into our data frame as actual images, which I've highlighted here. So if you've had a lot more rows though, wouldn't it be difficult to figure out which ones we have problems in? Well, in, we can actually quickly pull up a data frame that'll show us everywhere where actual images does not equal the expected images. And so we can get a data frame with just our problem books. And if we wanna break those books into more, so let me know before we move on that our list of four books starts with the number zero because with counting of computers, we're starting with zero. And our problem books are books zero and three. So those are the first and last one. Okay, so I've written some code and ran it that's hidden here. There's a function and a class, and this is just getting into some more substantially um, advanced data structures in terms of working with things, these things, but they're already written and you can use them to process these books in the Google Drive. So one of the things that I did here was to go ahead and load up the first and last book from our list. That, so I went ahead, so you, right where you see Python-based quality control, and then there's that green text, that's a comment, and it says instantiate book directory path and book class or first and last books in line. So that's what I'm talking about. Right there, all I did was just say, hey, this is a book and then we're accessing this other data that's currently hidden. But the part at the bottom at, that's highlighted in red, that's where I ran a book report, in this case, a last book report. And so when I pulled this book report, it actually told me what my error is and it's telling me, hey, some images are missing, two images are missing. And if I wanna know what those are, I can do so just by putting in print my book missing files. Though in this case, my book is actually how I've defined it, last book. So we're gonna go ahead and just run print last book missing files. And then we go ahead and see that what we're missing is, hey, we're actually missing images seven and eight out of this book. Moving down further, I went ahead and ran a first, a first book report. And in this one, the arrow is actually pointing at the file name and it's not what we expected, which in this case is, um, uh, written off the configuration of how we handle things at my university, which is the identifier for the directory creates the identifier for the individual files inside just with like an underscore. But in this instance, we're actually seeing that the first image is named one.jpg and not what we had wanted. But the last line right there is telling me if everything is there, the code can actually go ahead and rename my images for me right there. And we can do so just by writing first underscore book dot rename images with, you know, like .jpg in there. And so you can actually see that on the next line. So we go ahead and we can run the, uh, so we go ahead and we run that rename and then we run the first book report again and hooray, no errors. So based off of what your needs are and the configuration that you are wanting to apply or work onto things, that's gonna be able to drive and really kind of formulate where you want to or take the code that you're working with. Um, 
Python is one of the most common programming languages in the world with a huge community of developers and open source projects you can borrow from. Running it locally puts you in fully in control in contrast to Google Colab, and it allows to scale to very large files and data sets. But setting up Python and installing Python programs is not nearly as easy as AppleScript and Colab. You will need to use the terminal and dedicate significant time to setting up your computer. Okay, so here's the we want you part. We are the experts. We know what we want, and more importantly, we know what we need. So what do we need as a community to successfully build software for cultural heritage? We simply need to develop software using organized, repeatable best practices that, worked for, that works best for us and that solve our needs. I have begun working on an open source repository that is specific to, cult to the cultural heritage community and focused on our problems. If others join me in this effort, we can create a community-based collaborative code base that does not require high-level expertise to use, much like the book.report example in the Google Colab. And the best part of such collaboration is that everyone can contribute. Every person in this virtual room and beyond can provide input, feedback, and requests. And those of us with, those of us with coding experience or an interest in learning about coding can write and improve the code itself. Welcome to open source software development. This is nothing new. We just propose to really increase our community's use of it and expose our community's needs to the broader world of open software development where hopefully we can get a lot of other people to start contributing and solving the problems that we have. So here's the repository on GitHub. I've got a readme and a license file. It's currently open source as Apache 2.0. Please contact me if you have suggestions as to why or what it should be otherwise. There's a docs directory containing files to assist in setting up a direct development environment in Mac OS. There's one for um, Catalina and there's one for Mojave. And the first Python script can be found in the test directory, which uses PyTest to verify that Jove is installed in the correct default location on your Mac operating system. So, so I'll kick it back to in summary. So in summary, yes, coding can sometimes be hard, but it's not maybe as hard as you think. And it's easier if you're doing it as part of the community, especially if you're taking someone else's code and tweaking it. Coding can be quite straightforward. Coding can also automate and simplify tasks where the rules are clear and they can always apply. That's what code is good at, relentless, consistent execution on a set of rules that are clear. If you're just getting started, of the languages available, we think that Python and AppleScript are two really good languages to start learning. They're by no means not the only languages out there. There are literally hundreds, probably thousands, but those two are good starting points if you are brand new and want to contribute, especially to the cultural heritage or image workflow and digitization and digital image management side of coding. And lastly, we would love for you to join this GitHub. It is a place and a way in which we can work together and create and improve code specific to cultural heritage. I think that could be transformative. So in a moment, We'll be looking at a few minutes of Q&A, and we'll be able to answer the questions that have popped up. If you haven't yet put your question in the chat dialogue, or if you put it in earlier, uh, just know that Arnab in the chat is moderating the comments, and he will be flagging things for us to answer. So if you've not received an answer, you will receive it as we go to the Q&A. At least as long as we have time, we will sit and answer. But before we do that q and have to make this screen bigger to be able to access the next. Before we access the Q&A, we do have a favor to ask. We've just put up and we've mentioned already that we'll be doing this capstone class later this year. Obviously the exact schedule is dependent on the state of the country and exactly when it is safe and happy for everybody to travel. So it's gonna be approximately a two day class, probably around 12 hours worth of content. That's quite a lot of intensive learning in two days. So popping up in your window is a survey asking you if you'd be interested this is not a hard or firm commitment, just an indication that you may or may not be interested. And if you're interested, where in the world you think would be best, if it is New York or LA, or if you prefer to, uh, to be online. My general inclination is often to do classes in general via online. It's very democratizing, everybody can access. However, do keep in mind 12 hours of content is maybe not as conducive to 
uh, online as it would be in person, and I'd also really enjoy meeting other coders. So take that survey. Again, this is not a firm commitment. You're not signing up. Uh, you're just indicating and helping us with our logistical planning. So with all that said, I'm going to advance here. Actually, Jeremy, can you grab that slide and advance it one more to Q&A? Arnab, what questions do we have? So Arnab has flagged the first question here. Anything that speaks against JavaScript for automation as a viable option? I get quite straightforward results with C1 automation using JXA. So far, the additional benefits of the desktop UI frameworks like Electron being easy to reach with them. So I can speak directly to using Capture One with either AppleScript natively or the JA, JXA derivative of AppleScript. JavaScript for automation is a perfectly fine way of approaching Capture One automation. The main reason we suggested AppleScript is that I think it is slightly more approachable for people who are trying to accomplish fairly simple tasks, like the examples I had on the screen. That is partly a preferential or personal thing that I am saying. Uh, if you have any experience with JavaScript in general, that would be a fantastic way of accessing the capabilities of AppleScript using JavaScript. I will answer that as finished. Arnab, we're ready for our next question. What do you think of MATLAB? So perhaps, Jeremy, you could speak to image manipulation and methodology that you'd be using in MATLAB versus other software packages. Jeremy, are you able to hear me? Kate, if you could check in on Jeremy's audio. Until then, uh, let's go ahead and keep this flagged for follow-up. And Arnab, if you could flag a different question. In terms of book scanning, is there a way to automate saving files if the color, if the image is color, therefore JP2, or if the image is black and white, therefore bitonal? The answer to that is absolutely. So in Capture One, Capture One allows you to draw whether or not something is black and white or has a specific token or adjustment applied to it, or you could use a color tag to indicate a status like that. So the workflow would basically look like this. You would do your book scanning. You would either manually flag something as black and white or draw off the fact that you converted to black and white in the adjustments. And in the Apple script, you'd have an if statement. So if black and white, run this code. If color, no. Uh, if color put out as bitonal. That is a really good example of automation. Bit of a bug here. Um, but the next question is, why is AppleScript most likely to go away soon? I got sound again. That's a great question. Oh, Jeremy, you're back. Great. So, Jeremy, this is, a, I think, a, a soap top, soapbox topic for you. Give us the status politically of AppleScript today and where it might be in two years, five years, and 20 years. Still nothing from Jeremy, eh? Okay, no problem. So I'll address that. AppleScript is not very actively maintained anymore. That is a decision that Apple seems to have made over the last few years. It is still fully in 100 support, 100% 100 supported in the current operating system. If I had to make an informed guess, and that's all it is, if you all have better source information at Apple, I would love to have more definitive or more conclusive statements. But if I had to guess, Apple Script will still be included in the next operating system and probably the one after that. But when you start talking about three or four or five years from now, it becomes a lot more iffy. And if you're talking about 10 or 20 years from now, the answer is almost surely not. Now, Apple is making some efforts to migrate over to a JavaScript derivative. That was a question that was asked earlier. And I assume Apple will always provide some framework for automation of their applications and applications running their operating system. But if we compare AppleScript to Python, one of them has a community of tens of thousands of users, and one of them has a community of tens of millions of users. So in the very long run, Python is probably a sure long-term bet. But I still love and use AppleScript on a routine basis, and it's a great way to get coding very immediately. Question from Patrick, just out of curiosity, that Doug used to work at Capture Integration. So I graduated from Ohio University with a Bachelor of Science in 2007. I joined a company named Capture Integration shortly thereafter. I worked there for several years. 
I lived in Miami, so if anybody knows me from Florida, I hope you're all doing well. Uh, I then moved on to Digital Transitions, where I have been for the last, uh, what is that now, eight years, and I uh, am now one of the owners of Digital Transitions. Would be nice to distinguish between what we could use programming around C1 and what you can actually use for programming when actually interacting with C1. That's a fantastic, more of a comment than a question, but I love those in, in this sort of format. Uh, so AppleScript can do a variety of general purpose programming, right? You can do image processing or derivative generation or file and folder management, but for sure, the singular advantage of AppleScript that is different and apart from, for example, Python, is the ability to directly speak to an application in its own language. So to say, tell Capture One to capture using the currently connected camera. To do that using Python would either be impossible or would require using Python to tell AppleScript to tell something or would otherwise be a very roundabout method. In AppleScript, it's literally tell application capture one, capture. That's it, two lines of code. So capture one, if you're programming around it, meaning that you're not necessarily needing to control and interact directly with capture one, but whether you want to be able to pick up files before or after, uh, generally interact with derivatives coming out of Capture One, but not necessarily directly control the tools and functions of Capture One, then you can use basically any language. And Python, I think, was a really good recommendation in this webinar as a place to start, but you could also use other languages to do that other general purpose programming. When you're interacting directly with Capture One, I'd strongly suggest either AppleScript natively, or as a question was asked earlier, the JavaScript iteration or incarnation of AppleScript. Great questions. I got to tell you, these are fantastic questions. We have at least another 10 minutes to spend together, so please keep them coming. Does any of this work with regular Capture One Pro or only with CH and Enterprise? That's a fantastic question. So let's first start by defining the question. Capture One comes in a variety of sort of flavors. These are different licenses. They cost different amounts of money. And in exchange for different amounts of money, these different flavors of Capture One offer different features and different abilities to interact with different kinds of files. Capture One CH stands for Capture One Cultural Heritage, and it's a specific version of Capture One that allows you to do things like control a camera on a copy stand to tell the camera to go up and down, to engage tools like automatic cropping that within the workflow itself without having to generate a derivative and come back, can just natively crop the image as a metadata tag, uh, things like PPI measurements, so you can just drag a line across a ruler and it tells you what PPI you're shooting at, and so on. Capture One Enterprise is a special version of Capture One that has features specific to commercial workflows, such as, for example, uh, barcode scanning. There's a barcode scanner built into Capture One Enterprise that is great for those doing high volume product photography, maybe lay flats, doing that in an e commerce setting. So the question was, I'm just defining the question for people who don't know what those Capture One versions are. The question was, does any of this work with the regular Capture One Pro or only with Capture One CH and Enterprise? And the answer is a lot of it works with any version. Both Capture One CH and Capture One Enterprise offer additional tools. If you wish to automate around those specific tools, you have to have that version of Capture One. So if you want to automate something around, for example, the control of the camera, uh, Arnab, who's in the chat, has automated the control of the position of the camera to do focus stacking at a very specific way that he needed to do for a scientific application. Because the tool itself is only available in Capture One CH, that is a automation you could only access if you had Capture One CH. Uh, there are also, I think, in the long run, going to be more and more tools and specific hooks added for automation in those two versions. To be clear, the roadmap for Capture One is absolutely to make Capture One CH and Capture One Enterprise that go to solutions if you're in those multi-user high volume environments. So I would expect them to continue to add value to those software packages that are specific to things like tying them into other systems, automation, and programming. Jeremy, you're back online for audio? Yes. Fantastic. Because I tell you what, man, one of those questions was going to be better for you to answer. So I'm going to reframe an earlier question. <laughs> you should have like waved your hands a lot. <laughs> and then Jeff, uh, Jeff, I will get to your question here in a minute. But first, I would like to show you, I'd like to bring up the Jeremy, the question I was asked earlier. Jeremy, 
What do you think about MATLAB in the context of this conversation? What are its pros and cons? And maybe you can start by defining what MATLAB is. Gotcha. So um, MATLAB is, um, actually, I, I responded to this one directly in chat. I think Leah asked it. And I, I, my response was MATLAB is expensive. <laughs> um, MATLAB is a uh, scientific, at this point, I would actually say um, playground, really. It, 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 it's a so it's a structure and way of developing and writing code to um, use software for um, uh, scientific applications. So, like for instance, the uh, the work that's done under the hood for Open Dice is all written in MATLAB. Um, uh, my uh, I, I've never used MATLAB. There's an open source version of it called Octave, but not everything translates back and forth completely. And so, um, it one of the things that you'll actually see now is that there's a large uh, contingent of folks that are moving to um, uh, Python for data science and data analysis applications um, explicitly because uh, um, if you're not working in a um, uh, supercomputer type of situation where you might it, it, where MATLAB might make more sense in terms of how the, the code needs to be written to access and work with things, then if you need to work with huge data and data sets and doing deep learning, machine learning, um, all that stuff, there's uh, um, it's actively being developed on top of Python at the moment. Um, well, and so I would... my suggestion is to, if you want to be on the cutting edge of being able to take advantage of some things, um, the, the way to go would actually be to go with Python. I would agree with that wholeheartedly. Uh, the last thing I would add to that is that if you're already familiar with MATLAB, the advantages of continuing in the language you're comfortable with is probably uh, very strong. If you're starting from scratch of the options presented, we do think that Python is a better starting point for somebody to enter. It is a broader community. It's easier to get started. And I think it is deeper and more cutting edge support and community contributions. A lot of the most advanced machine learning, artificial intelligence, data visualization, software out there on any platform from any company is either written in Python as open source or started as open source and was expanded upon. All right, Arnav, if you yeah, can flag real up quick. another question um, for I, us. I know that uh, Ramona's question about why is AppleScript most likely to go away soon? Um, I think, uh, Jeremy, you had a, Doug had called you out for, for some comments on that. Is there anything you wanted to add on that? Oh. <laughs> um, so when I was doing the development of, um, so I, I've, I, I've got a library that's in my GitHub that hooks Apple script, uh, Python into Apple script so that I can create the Apple scripts that I need by writing Python. And when I was writing this and kind of like just doing some research and tweeting about this online, I had a number of people comment back to me, um, and, uh, who seemed very in the know, um, and sent some private message along the way of, uh, even to the point of they don't think there's anybody at Apple that's still working on Apple Script. So um, the, the thought that it's going to be a long-term solution probably isn't there. If you go and look at the actual Apple Script official documentation support, look at the date on that and then realize when how many computers you've bought since that was written. <laughs> you know, even just as a, you know, a really silly kind of uh, scale of time for that. Because um, I want to say it's like 20, 2009, maybe. Maybe 2012. Yeah. Um, uh, my son was born in 2006. So <laughs> yeah. And he's 14 now. So, <laughs> you know, it, you, I, think you, that, uh, I think that addresses the core. The yeah. core concern. It is still a valuable tool. It will still be a valuable tool for years to come, but probably not for decades to come. Yes. Okay. Yes. Hey. Absolutely. But there's there's not really a lot of cutting edge new things being built on top of it. If you want to do that type of stuff, you should definitely. And you're wanting to be directly in Mac OS, definitely jump into Swift. So we have a question from Tyler. How easy is it to integrate images from other cameras into a C1 workflow? So the answer is going to depend, of course, on what the other camera images are and what your workflow is. Uh, other cameras, Capture One Pro itself supports a huge variety of cameras. Capture One Enterprise supports a huge variety of cameras. I think they're up to 400 each. Um, in Capture One Culture Heritage, that only supports DT and phase one cameras. So the phase one IXG, the DTR cam, uh, phase one XF, those cameras. So in that case, in Capture One Culture Heritage, the ease of integration is zero because it does not integrate with any other cameras. For Capture One Pro and for Capture One Enterprise, 
the answer is that it is open to all of these other cameras and it can work for a huge variety of different cameras. I think I have one for you, uh, Jeremy. Bash scripting, first to find terminal and bash in Unix. And what are the pros and cons of using bash scripting for culture? Born again shell. I want to say that's what bash stands for. I don't remember the acronym. I assume it's a acronym. <laughs> I feel like I could. Um, so the bash shell um, is. Uh, it, can I can can I share my screen? Is that okay? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Let me, let me share. Oh wow. So I, I will uh, admonish, not admonish. I will advise you that we do have quite a few questions, so I would keep this as a abbreviated gotcha. answer. So I confirm we do see your screen. Uh, so, currently we see um, both screen. Jeremy, currently we see both of your screens. I think you probably want to share just either the terminal or one screen. How's that? That's perfect. <laughs> and okay, I would so also make the, I would also make the font, Jeremy, I'd make the font just a little bit bigger. Yeah, that's much better. Great. Okay. So all I did was open up terminal and I ran which and that dollar sign shell in all capital letters and it said slash bin slash bash. And so bash is the shell that by default on everything before Mac OS Catalina um, is the language that you can act and like inter actively work for, work actively and directly engage with your computer from the command line. Um, it's probably the fastest, um, quickest way to get started. Uh, it, it's also not the most user friendly. Um, I. Uh, actually, I, I personally started with Bash, and my, my suggestion now would be to wholeheartedly um, jump right into Python as opposed to um, doing Bash from the standpoint that you'll be able to go further faster. And yes. you can always go back and learn the shell, but those things are always changing. Like, for instance, the, as I said, the Bash, the, the default shell on Mac OS is Bash, but the, or for um, Mojave and everything previous, but the current Mac OS is Catalina. And the default shell on that one is ZSH. So those types of things change. So I will just throw in that basically the pro would be if you already know that, either from previous Unix or Linux work or from previously working in Bash, regardless of, of how you learned it, that's a huge pro. Uh, the huge con is that there is far less out there in terms of modern cutting edge stuff in it. And it is harder to develop in in that the tools that you have for developing a script in AppleScript, for example, are very visual and very easy to feed back. The tools for Python are very easy to get robust development tools. You know, you have the sort of equivalent of Microsoft Word instead of text edit, whereas Bash is fairly utilitarian to write and to troubleshoot. And Bash is everywhere. That mm -hmm. would be a big. Oh, that's um, true. And it would also be cross-platform, which is another big advantage, although only sort of cross-platform because you have to modify the code depending Doug, on the Doug, I just wanted to bring up this. All right. Are there any Apple scripts for Capture One that can be repurposed or edited for specific purposes? I, I tell you what, Raphael, Raphael, you're going to get from me a special extra heavy discount code because you reminded me to talk about the DT Apple scripts codes. Uh, so maybe uh, either Arnab or Kate could put in a link to pop up at the bottom to what is called the DT Apple script kit. It is a tool set that we have developed specifically to allow people to have a better starting point than literally starting with an empty document. I'd emphasize you should read the page that it's on and understand that the context of these tools is to give you starting points and jumping off points and examples of starting points, as opposed to, you know, take this script and you're going to run it exactly as is and that's going to solve whatever problem you have. It, it's very possible you may have a specific problem that one of these scripts perfectly solves. But the intention is for you to be able to use those scripts as a starting point to make your own code. As far as I'm aware, that is the main source right now of Apple scripts for Capture One. Uh, but if you just Google Capture One and Apple Script, maybe you'll find other people's out there doing some. But uh, especially I in the sort of context of polished. Mm -hmm. That's fantastic. So Jeremy will be posting some up in the GitHub. Those will be free and open source. Uh, ours, you see the code, you see the documentation, you see explanations for the code. And then you are free to do whatever you'd like with that code other than uh, resell the code as is, exactly as is. OK. Um, one question here, how much will a certificate cost? Do not know yet. Uh, it is a two-day class, and I think it will have a lot of value. So I don't think it's going to be an inexpensive class. But we also understand that people will often be paying for it out of their own pockets. So we will try to keep it reasonably approachable. 
What do you think of using OpenCV for film in, in painting uh, techniques? Sorry. What do you think of using OpenCV for film and painting techniques and automation and scratch, automation of scratch and dust recognition? I gotta tell you, totally out of scope for today, but please, Lewis, stay tuned for events three, four, and five. And please consider taking that capstone class because you are asking a master's level question in what is the equivalent of a 101 introduction class. Uh, but again, feel free to email Jeremy or I, and you know, maybe we can have a conversation offline. If I'm already familiar with the basics of Python, but are more interested in image processing tools within, oh, oh no, how did I mark? I, I marked this accidentally as answered, so I'll just read it out again. <laughs> if I'm go. already <laughs> familiar with the basics of Python, but I'm more interested in image processing tools within Python, do you have any recommended courses or tutorials to learn more specifically about image processing tools specifically? So let's just quickly define the question. One of the things that makes Python Python is that you can import somebody's module that they've already written, and that module will have various commands around a specific theme. So for example, you might import a module that does, for example, OCR, and the OCR will then, that module will have commands that can read OCR, can perform OCR on a PDF or on a JPEG or a TIFF with different subcommands to, for example, manipulate the text that it pulls off or settings that change the way that it's interacting with the, the image. So the question that Andrew is asking is, I've already got the basics of Python. Would you recommend any specific cases, courses or tutorials about image processing tools? Absolutely, I do have a recommendation for you, and that is part four, getting started with Python. If you're already familiar with the basics, at least half of that class will be redundant, but the latter half as we start to import specific modules and work with them might be very helpful to you, and certainly, certainly the capstone. In addition, Jeremy, do you have any recommendations for specific tutorials? I mean, other than saying just go on the internet and type in to Google, I want to learn Python image processing. Do you have any specific tutorials or, you know, WebEx? I class actually have recommend? a, I just put in the chat. Um, I taught a image processing with Python and Jupyter Notebooks workshop at the Texas Conference on Digital Libraries in 2018. Well, there's and a great one. With uh, Todd Peters from Texas State University. And the link for that workshop is there. Um, we haven't updated it because we wanted to leave the code exactly where it was. But if anybody has any questions or need help with getting started. And um, I would also uh, call upon anyone in the chat if you have personal experience with a particular class that you can endorse as being useful to the questioner, please feel free to throw it in the chat. Part of all the whole point of this is the community sense of helping each other out. Okay. Can Python scripting be done with older versions of Capture One or does it have to be version 20? So for clarity, Python does not directly interact with Capture One. You have two main options there. You can use Python to access Apple Scripts. So if you're comfortable writing Python, but you want to access tools and features directly inside of Capture One to tell Capture One to take a picture or to engage AutoCrop or to apply an adjustment or to process an image from raw to TIFF, then you would need to be accessing it via Apple Script or JavaScript encapsulation of Apple Script. So Python is much better for things like getting data into to prepare Capture One for something or to then handle the post-process flow of JPEGs and TIFFs that Capture One is putting out. So that is where the advantage of Apple Script comes in as compared to Python. So for me, I was gonna say that um, over this past weekend, I just got my code up for working for Capture One 20. So mm -hmm. my code also works for 12. Um, both versions are still in uh, GitHub in terms of being able to access stuff. Mm -hmm. So there's code for Capture One Pro 20 and Capture One Pro 12. I don't have 10 or eight and no reason to really go back. So <laughs> sure. if anybody needs something older than that. Very good. Well, I don't see any new questions. So we will make one last call. Uh, we are conveniently coming right up to the one hour mark. So I am glad to say that we will take another question if we get it shortly. Otherwise, uh, we, should, uh, we should sign off shortly after the one hour mark. We can be a little flexible. Okay, so I do see some questions coming into the chat. Arnab, if you can continue to uh, flag those as questions, but I'll address the first one I see here in the chat. Will phase one extend their SDK game before AppleScript JXA gets potentially defunct? The answer to that question is absolutely positively. Uh, in fact, the, the Capture One SDK is going to get extended this summer, and therefore we have the getting started with Capture One SDK on the agenda. I can't tell you much about that, both because I'm not allowed to tell you that much about it and also because they are literally still working on it. So exactly what will and will not be done 
are still being worked out. Uh, but Cash One SDK, an SDK is a way of more methodically and more powerfully interacting with a particular piece of software. So for example, the SDK would have a substantially more native feeling than trying to jerry-rig together Python with AppleScript to tell Capture One to do something and could be integrated into other programs or more advanced software than just a small script. So it's a little bit harder learning curve to work with an SDK in some ways as compared to a couple lines of AppleScript. Uh, but it is also more powerful. So if you are developing full-fledged features or full-fledged applications, or you just are more comfortable working with an SDK environment, Capture One will have an SDK, uh, and it will be updated and significantly expanded. Is it currently possible to capture from an SLR through a remote uh, Raspberry Pi, USB, and Capture One SDK and connect to a network Mac running Capture One. Boy, that is a specific question, and it sounds like you have a very specific problem you're trying to solve. It's a very specific First, use case. Running the R&D team at DT has taught me that very often it's best to think about from the user's perspective why they're asking the question, not just the exact specific question you're asking. So if you have a very specific use case that you're trying to solve or a very specific problem you're trying to address, my suggestion would be to reach out to DT and we can see if we can help you with that. But I will answer your specific question. Yes, if today you're using a phase one camera, you can use the phase one SDK, and you can run that on a variety of platforms and connect that across the network to store, which Capture One could pick up. I suspect strongly it's not the single easiest way to solve whatever underlying problem you're having, but I could be wrong because of course I don't know that much and it's a little bit out of scope to get a little bit deeper in there with you. Hopefully that was still helpful. Could you make a keywords list? I don't know most of the words you are using. And this is definitely, I, I feel uh, some sympathy here. This was about terminology at the beginning of our presentation that when you're just getting into something, even normal words that you just throw around could also be totally opaque. Uh, I would ask you, Rebecca, if you have specific questions about specific words, maybe you could throw into the chat. We do not have a keywords list. Um, and I know it can be intimidating at the very beginning. If you write code for Capture One 20, will it integrate with updated versions of Capture One? I have been writing code for Capture One since version eight, eight or nine, uh, not back at four, five, or six, but yeah, somewhere somewhere in that ballpark. Most of it still runs in Capture One 20, but we did mention very specifically that one of the cons of coding or one of the costs of coding uh, at the very beginning of this rather long presentation was maintaining the code. Maintaining code is shorthand or a verb that we use in, in the industry or in programming to talk about making small modifications because it will otherwise break or stop working or to make improvements because the underlying need has changed. So you can't necessarily just develop 20 lines of code and expect that five years later, it will be using the exact same code will do the exact same thing. That is unfortunately not always the case. What I will say is there are a lot of people who do code for Capture One and they are fairly sensitive to trying to keep backwards compatibility. They usually follow pretty good practice regarding deprecating commands for a few generations before they then just totally cut them out, uh, meaning that they're warning you, hey, you should not be using it this way, you should be using it this way, but this other way will still keep running for at least another version or two. Um, so the answer is maybe, usually. <laughs> Okay, uh, one last question here. Try the Apple script for crop and capture one. Can't get it to work. If you have multiple C1, doesn't have to be super specific. So I will give you a quick story about why I did not become a professional computer programmer. It is a totally true story. I did computer programming starting at the age of 10. I had by the age of whatever age I would have been by senior year of high school, uh, summer before my senior year, I had developed an entire suite of applications that analyzed vibration data in a road simulation context. Not very exciting stuff, but it was very, very niche and was great. Uh, one night I was up and I started at like 7 a.m. in the morning programming and I had one specific bug I was trying to work out. I would run the code and it wouldn't work. And it wouldn't work in a really funny way. It would work and then work and then work and then work and then not work and then work and then work and then, work and then, work and then, work and then not work. It wasn't every fifth or every 10th or every other totally seemed to be random. I spent the entire day, 15 hours in a row of doing that. And uh, at the end of the day, you know what I found, Jeremy? You know why the code wasn't working? 
<laughs> I had redefined a variable, and at the end of that definition, it's supposed to be a semicolon. I had put a colon. That was it. There was one freaking character in that code, and it totally screwed everything up. So in that context, yes, whatever problem you're having trying to type that code into Capture One, probably something as simple as, for example, depending on where you copy and paste from, inward facing quotation marks versus straight up and down quotation marks are different. So I can't tell you specifically what's wrong with your code. One of the arts of coding is that 90% of coding is troubleshooting the code you've already written. Uh, but I sympathize with you that it's not working and I would encourage you to sign up for the getting started with Apple script, which would be uh, part three or part four. Yeah, writing code, I definitely learned about more characters on my keyboard. <laughs> yeah. Like, oh, there's a back tick. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there are five different kinds of dashes. Who would have thought? <laughs> All right, everyone, we will have to end it here. I'm sure there were more questions that you may have wanted to ask. We so appreciate your time. Please register for part two. You can do that in the bottom right corner. And please stay on our mailing list for parts three through five. Email us with questions. Jeremy has placed his contact information in the chat. Mine is DEP, as in Douglas Edward Peterson, at digitaltransitions.com, DEP. And I cannot thank you enough for spending the day with us. I don't want to leave without saying that we understand these are very hard times. And while we've tried to maintain a very positive and happy vibe today, we are thinking of anybody who is going through hard times. We hope everyone remains safe and sane in these hard times. If you are having problems, please reach out. Uh, we are all in this together. This will end the formal presentation. Kate, you can end the course.